Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Long Neck Methodist Church on this beautiful, sunshiny Sunday morning. Sun came out about halfway through First Church, and uh, it was a wonderful morning for us to worship outside. And so now we thank you for coming with us here this morning. Please take the opportunity when you have it to look through your bulletins. Calendar is in there. All the things that are happening in the upcoming week are listed for you there on the calendar. Also, a couple of special announcements that you will see set forth for you. Please remember, you've seen on the screen behind me and also in your bulletins and on Facebook and every place else, we are continuing our Sunday school supply collection for Long Neck Elementary School. If you have any indication or have a desire to make those donations, we're going to continue. That's all right. I just, you know, it's okay. I have, I have the, only, the only call you should be answering here this morning should be the one from God. Then you know what? We'll wait. We shall wait. <laughs> Do not send God to voicemail. <laughs> he may not call back. <laughs> the the, uh, the, the uh, list that you have for the donations... We're going to collect them all the way through them until the 21st of August. List is behind us. List is in your bulletin. List is on the Facebook. And if all else fails, please give Karen a call. She'll provide you with the list. We're going to do something a little different this year as well. Denise Barnes came up with the wonderful idea that we would have young people who are going back to school, if they have their book bags ready to roll, bring them in on the same day that we're going to collect the new supplies. And so we'll bless the book bags of the kids who have them that are going back to school. We'll bless everybody. We'll just get them all ready to go back to school because you know they're so happy about the prospect of going back to school. So we'll do that. The shopping cart was filled this morning as we came in, but it will be emptied. And you will you might notice as you head out of hospitality, all along this back wall are the supplies that we're, gra we're gathering. It is a wonderful thing to see. Um, and the need is great. The need is great for our young people. So we, uh, we appreciate you as you continue to do that. This morning we also had the opportunity at First Church. We're taking the taking the time to recognize our young people who are moving up, moving out, moving on. It's getting to be that time. Summer is, is, is slipping away. Um, many of the kids have already started, many of the young people, sorry, have already started going back to college if they're returning for athletics or things along those lines. Folks are going for the very first time. We, this week we talked about uh, both Alex Plenting and Alexander Ryan. Alexander Ryan will be beginning her education in the nursing program through the University of Delaware. Always need more good nurses. If you've had the opportunity to be at one of our hospitals lately, you know that one of the things that are in short supply are good nurses. You don't necessarily need the doctors. The nurses are the ones that make the, make the world go round. And so we pray for Alexandra as she begins her program of study uh, through the University of Delaware. And then Alex Bunting will be leaving on Friday to uh, do his matriculation at the Virginia Military Institute. He will be going down there with an eye towards commissioning in the United States Army. So we give both of them all of our prayers and our blessings. Lift them up through the week, and as you remember them, as they continue to move on with yet a new challenge in their lives. Uh, prayer concerns, if I can, if I just start out with those this morning before we move into recognizing those who are here for the first time. Um, Daniel and Sandy Myers are both under the weather, uh, so I'd ask you to lift both of them up. Uh, Bobby Jo Collins, who attends First Church, she is also under the weather. And Lindsay Barnes, um, Bob and Denise's daughter, we ask you to continue to lift her up. She is now a patient at Christiana Hospital um, where they're continuing to do tests. So all of those folks, in addition to the ones who are on our regular prayer list and the ones that you have in your heart and your mind and your souls, lift them up for healing, the healing that only God can bring and the healing that God continues to give us each and every day of our lives. Are there any folks who are visiting us from uh, uh, someplace else who would like to introduce themselves? I don't see anybody, but of course I can't see with all the lights on. No first timers? All right. I think the I think the highlight goes last week's introduction that they live in the United States of America, <laughs> just so that we wouldn't figure out where they were really from. This morning, we, uh, as, as you've seen, uh, June, uh, June continues on her leave of absence, so we'll move right into our centering hymns this morning. We'll ask you to rise and sing together if you're able, in body or in spirit. This is the day, number 657 in your hymnal or on the screen behind us. Um, also, uh, we're going to sing that through twice, so rise together and sing with us if you will. Number 657, this is the day.
join me in the call to worship. In the fire and the flames, the Spirit appears to bless and inspire us. In the division and despair of life, Christ arise to challenge and invite us. In the shadows and the sorrow, God walks alongside to lift us up. In this moment, we gather together to worship, to pray, to sing, and to share. We gather on this blessed journey together. Amen. Our opening hymn is How Firm a Foundation. Please join with me in the opening prayer. The Christ of mysterious paradox, enter into our lives this day. Unify us where others seek to divide and separate us from one another. Connect us so securely that we may connect with one another in the power of the Holy Spirit as we worship together this day. Amen. Our first reading today is from Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he trembled and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. This is the word of God for the people of God. Be you may be seated. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Leslie. <clears throat> this is the time as we gather together in worship as we come on Sunday mornings. We gather in our corporate worship. We gather in our collective prayer. So join me, if you will, now at the throne of grace as we pray to God for this continued blessings and give thanks for what he has shared with us. 
Almighty and gracious God, for the day we begin, we thank you. We thank you for waking us up this morning and bringing us to this place, not by our choice, but by the conviction of the Holy Spirit who has spoken with us, in us, and through us, that we may come to be with our brothers and sisters in Christ to hear what you will have laid upon our hearts and our ears this day. We come to worship you, Lord, and it is a privilege and a blessing and an honor that we have to come to this place on holy ground to share with the world the fact that we worship the one and only true God, the risen Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit as we come together three in one and one in three this day. We pray, Lord, that you will be with each person that is on our heart today, those that we have mentioned at the outset of our service, those who are ill and injured, those who are heading off to college and university, and those who are preparing to do new things in their lives. We ask you to be with them and to bless them. We ask you to be with those that are ill, those that are ill among us in this place today, those that are sick, those that are recovering from illnesses and injuries and surgeries and treatments. We pray, Lord, that you will give them peace, the peace that passes every bit of understanding and the peace that we need as the children of God that sometimes we seek so diligently but give up on so quickly. We pray that you will continue your healing power with those who are ill. Be also with those who have left this earthly rock and have moved on, Lord, to be in your presence. Welcome them with open arms and shower your love upon them in your presence. Be with our leaders from the top of our country to the bottom of our world, wherever we may be in between, the most important leader and the least important leader and all in between, that we may know, Lord, that we are leaders only by your grace and that we are all charged to care for your people. Wisdom and guidance and discernment and good temperament and honesty and integrity are the hallmarks of a good leader. And so where those hallmarks are found lacking, Lord, we pray that you will instill upon them those who are entrusted with leadership. Be with our church and its leaders, its teams, its volunteers, its people, that we may make the right decisions and move in the right way as you have called us to extend your kingdom. Be, Lord, with all of our men and women in uniform as they continue to serve us across this globe those in all of the armed services who defend and protect us, that we may come today to worship you. Provide them peace and safety while they're on their tour and bring them home to their family. We pray also that you will be with every person who is involved in the healing arts, from the doctors to the nurses to the therapists to the healers, including the paramedics and the ambulance attendants, the fire service, the police, everyone in between, Lord, that runs to danger and takes care of us when we are in our greatest need. Be with them, Lord, and bless them. Bless them and keep them safe that they may return to their family. We pray, Lord, that where we are not worthy, where we are not righteous, where we are weak in our faith, that you will say the word and make us, make us worthy and righteous and strong in our faith. Help us to become strong in what you have called us to do as we come to worship you this day. Bless this time that we have together today that it may be used in a way which is pleasing in your sight. We humbly ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Savior. Amen. Our prayer hymn today, Nearer My God to Thee, number 528 in your hymnals or on the screen behind us. I ask if you are able to rise in body or in spirit and sing together that famous old hymn of the church, Near My, Nearer My God to Thee, number 528.
Thank you, church. You may be seated. As you have seen, our ushers have come forth to receive our tithes and our offerings, so let us pray this morning. Almighty and gracious God, for the many blessings you have given us, we give you thanks. But now is the time for us to do the stewardship that you have called us to do, to return to you a portion of all of the good things that you have given us, not the last part, not the begrudging part, but to give with the heart of a faithful servant and a joyful person who gives back to you, that your kingdom may be expanded here, not only in Long Neck, but throughout this world, that all may hear and know and receive and love the gospel as we do. Bless this offering, bless those who will give and those who shall receive. We humbly ask in Christ's name. Church, please rise. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you, saints. You may be seated. Thank you, ladies. Any of you recognize that hymn that we sang just beforehand because it was made popular by a movie not long ago? You might remember the movie Titanic. That was the movie that the band was playing as the ship sank. I'm praying that that is not an indication of how things are going to go here this morning. As we gather together, phew, I thought about that. It's like, hmm, <laughs> Oh, this morning, let's start with something from the Old Testament, shall we? We had the opportunity to hear from the, the book of the Acts of the Apostles when Leslie had shared a reading with us, but we'll go back all the way into the book of Joshua, an Old Testament prophet, Joshua. Today, we're going to go in Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 8 and 12 through 18. Hear these words, reading along in your own Bible, the screen behind me, or simply hearing the words spoken to you. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, as I said to Moses. From the wilderness in this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and the great sea toward the going down of the sun, shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do all according to the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, 
that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate it in day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and you will have, and then you will have good success. And moving to verse 12 through 18. And to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half the tribe of Manish, Joshua spoke, saying, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God is giving you rest and is giving you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your livestock shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on this side of the Jordan. But you shall pass before your brethren armed, all your mighty men of valor, and help them until the Lord has given your brethren rest as he gave you, and they also may have taken possession of the land which the Lord your God has given them. Then you shall return to the land of your possession and enjoy it, which Moses, the Lord's servant, gave to you on this side of the Jordan towards the sunrise. So they answered Joshua, saying, All that you commanded us we will do, and wherever you send us we will go. Just as we heeded Moses in all things, so we will heed you. Only the Lord your God will be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your command and does not heed your words and all that you have commanded him shall be put to death. Only be strong and of good courage. Brothers and sisters, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As you know, we have spent the majority of our time this summer walking through the Old Testament, spending time with those Old Testament prophets. We've been hearing their prophecies and, and listening really to their warnings. Perhaps at some times, We've even been a little bit uncomfortable with the things that they say to us. But hopefully you understand. You understand as we move through this that the prophecies that we share and that we read in the Old Testament show us that the words from thousands of years ago are just as relevant today as they were then. And secondly, we understand hopefully that these words, these words of, of the prophets, they may cause worry or fear or concern. They may upset us a little bit, but really... They're, intending as, they're intended as a warning, an aid, a guide, a, an assistance, a flashing light, if you will, to point us in the right direction. They're warnings about the choices that we make and how those choices impact our lives as people of faith. Today, having heard from those prophets of old, I'd like to spend the time that we have talking a little bit about the choices that we make. There are many defining moments in the life of a person. There are moments which change our lives, sometimes in small ways and sometimes in ways that set the course of life forever. The defining moment can set the stage for the balance of your life when you're here on this rock called Earth. In the Acts, in the Acts of the Apostles, as Leslie read with us, we hear about Paul's defining moment, right? We hear about the flash, the light, the blindness, and his subsequent development of faith. We know that Paul wasn't the only one. Remember Moses? For Moses, his defining moment was a burning bush. Three of my favorites that we remember to sing about all the time from Sunday school, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the three of them who wander into the fiery furnace with flames all around, never getting scorched. How about Peter? For Peter, his defining moment was stepping out of the boat and walking on water. For Daniel, among the many things that were defining moments in his young lives, it was shutting the mouths of the lions in the lion's den. And now for Joshua, we see that one of his defining moments is parting the River Jordan and crossing over into the Promised Land. We could go on and on and on and spend a great deal of time looking at the people that are set forth for us in the, in the Holy Evangels. But we know by looking at what God's Word says that every one of these sermons had years of preparation leading up to their defining moment. Have you noticed that the ones that we find in the Bible have been working upon their call for a while before something happens? Very rarely does God just turn to you and say, Bill, let's go now. It happens, but most of us get a little warning to get the ability to work into it. The defining moments forced the servants of God and the experience they had to move a little bit beyond their own human power and their own human willpower. As I like to say, it's one of those things that takes us out of our box. You know, we all like our little boxes, right? We all like our little comfort zones. We like where they know us. You know, there may be a little craziness in my box, but I like it. They know me there. If you have not yet had one of those defining moments, it's coming. 
Most of us have had at least one, sometimes more, defining moments, and we know it when it happens. If you haven't had it yet, maybe God is preparing you for that defining moment. He prepares us in a variety of ways, but normally he prepares us for our defining moment in the experiences we have in life and in the people that we share our time on this rock together with. Events which happen to us as we grow up, all pointing to that one moment in time when we're about to leave all that we know, all that we have known, and strike out on the next part of our journey, our calling in life. Some of us have had our defining moments and are living the life of the call of God on our lives. Many of you have heard that call, and you are obedient to the call of God on your life. Some others are near the end of the journey, and they've already seen all of this by looking in the rearview mirror of life. But regardless of where we are along this journey, one thing we all have in common, we are called to have a relationship with God. We're called to have a vocation, a job, a position, a calling, something to do on this earth other than simply mark time. We know that there are a variety of defining moments in our lives as we move along this path. And the secret, the secret to a great life is the ability to see and to understand and discern those defining moments given to us, learning to walk the journey that leads to our ultimate destination. And once we have a defining moment, We are never going to be the same again. We spoke earlier in this first church, and again as we started this morning, we spoke about such a defining moment happening in the lives of our church with our young people. Young people of a variety of ages who are going in all sorts of different directions. Young people leaving the nest and all that they know and heading out into a college or a university or something else. If you're not heading out into a college, maybe it's a new job. Maybe it's a new home. Maybe it's a new relationship. Maybe it's a different calling. I know that comes as a surprise to some of you. But you know what? Even when you're in your 80s and above, you may get a different calling. Please answer the call when it comes. Don't let it go to voicemail. Don't say, I am tired, I am weak, I am worn, you got the wrong number. That calling can come. Many of you... Some of you are a little feebler than I, but many of you can recall that defining moment of leaving high school and moving out into life. Think back that far for some of you. You remember what it was like, right? For some of you, it was right out into the work world. For some, it was directly into the military. Some were blessed enough, a small number were blessed enough to be able to take time off and wander around and figure out who they were and find themselves. For others, those who were leaving home and school and hearth and moving off to college, it was the most intense crossroad of life. It was a time for a university, a time for college, a time for study away from home. For those folks who are leaving and moving out, there's going to be some newly acquired freedom. Mom and dad and parents and grandparents are no longer going to be in your ear constantly telling you what to do. But then you try to tell them, you know, there's going to come a time in your life that you will become frantic when you realize basically you are on your own. We look forward to it all our lives, right? We want to go, we want to, think about all those birthdays you've had. You know, you want to get 16 so you can drive. You want to get 18 so you can vote and get out of mom and dad's house. You want to get 21 so you can consume alcoholic beverages all throughout the world. You want to get, you want to get, and you achieve these things and you look back and say, I don't want to be a grown up anymore. The passage from Joshua shows us exactly what I'm talking about this morning. You know, Joshua had been with Moses all of his life, most of his adult life. And in the passage we see this morning in the very first chapter of of Joshua, we see that Moses had died. He'd left the scene. Having led the Israelites out of bondage, he led them through 40 years in the desert, hearing the whining and the complaining and the questioning and the doubting, all through those 40 years of trials and blessings in the wilderness. And he stands with them on the edge of greatness, about to enter into the promised land. Then we see how Moses is a person, just like all the rest of us. Because of his temperament, you remember what happened, right? His patience ran out. His patience ran out with God. God told him, Moses, speak to the rock, and what will happen? Water will flow. Moses, being an impatient boy, said, I'm not talking to a rock. I'm going to grab my stick, and I'm going to hit it. I'm going to hit it not just once. I'm going to hit it twice. And guess what happened to Moses? Boom, dead. Hmm. He struck the rock, which led to his physical death and the inability, after all he had been through, to step over into the promised land. He had gotten 
this close. And so here's Joshua, who had been mentored and groomed by Moses. He was being raised the entire time to take over leadership from Moses in the nation of Israel. In Joshua chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, God tells us repeatedly, Be strong and be courageous. In verse 9, which is one of my favorite verses in the book of Joshua, Joshua 1, verse 9, some of you who contact me in times of trial, I refer to you, Joshua 1, 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Brothers and sisters, it doesn't get much more plain to us than that. Even I can understand that one. Joshua today speaks directly to those folks who are launching out on those defining moments in the days and the weeks and the months and the years to come. And in doing so, he shares his thoughts not only with them, but with us. Joshua says to us this morning, the past is the past. Some of you remember this. Remember the old Disney movies that were on VHS? I know some of you, you haven't thrown that VHS recorder away, right? Because they're coming back. Just like guys have really fat ties or really skinny ties, and, well, we won't talk about what the women keep. But remember those movies? There was one I loved. It was called The Lion King. I loved the original Lion King. And in The Lion King, there was one character. His name was Rafiki. Remember Rafiki? Rafiki was the king's most trusted advisor, and his advice was always heeded. There's a passage where he's speaking to the up-and-coming leader, and the up-and-coming leader had done something wrong. And what does Rafiki do? He takes his walking stick and whacks him just as hard as he can upside the head. And the lion says, ouch! And Rafiki says, what? It doesn't matter. It's in the past. Joshua says to us this morning, the past is the past. In this passage this morning, Moses has died. He has passed away. A new leader is coming on the scene. And for those people in our church who are heading out, we have to remind them. Things like the carefree days of eating at mom's table, having anything you want to eat whenever you want to eat it, those days are gone. Being grounded, having a curfew, having a restrictions, they're gone away as well. But you know, there's going to come a life, there's going to come a time in life where you look back and say, boy, I wish I had that again. With that responsibility comes a great deal of doubt. Moses was gone. You're the leader now. We have to let go of the past in order to move forward. Please remember, we don't forget our past because we'll make the same mistakes over and over and over again if we forget our past. Remember Lot's wife? We spoke last week of Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah? We talked about that. And God had told her and her husband to get out of Sodom and Gomorrah because judgment was coming. He commanded them not to look back. But she did. She was turned into a pillar of salt. Don't worry, I said something the first church got me in trouble. I won't say it here. We are reminded to not live and look in the past. Because if we spend all of our time looking back and holding on to that stuff that we're dragging along behind us, it closes the opening doors of our future and reduces us just to an old block of salt. Joshua says to us something that most of us know, transitions are tough. Change is tough. God tells Joshua to go and cross this River Jordan at a time when the River Jordan was at flood stage. It was over its banks. It was not going to be easy. The waters were treacherous. And it says to us that God doesn't always lead us to places that are convenient and comfortable. Sometimes he leads us through troubled waters. It is not going to be easy being away from home for those who are going to college. There will be very significant changes. But we must, brothers and sisters, we must cross that River Jordan, our River Jordan, whatever it may be, because God has wonderful things for us. God has wonderful plans for us. There are blessings and open doors and joyful occasions on the horizon. But the way we get there may not be peaceful and tranquil. It may not be easy to get there. Those promises that God has made, they're yours for the taking. God has not brought you this far to leave you alone. We read in Scripture that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. God has already ordered your steps. They're there. In Joshua, verse 9, he says it will always be with us. In verse 7, he says that we will prosper. He will prosper us. And in verse 13, he says he will give us rest. 
all promises from God set forth by this Old Testament prophet. No matter what the path, no matter what the path, if God has selected it, then you can rest assured that he will make it happen. He will not fail you. Thirdly, Joshua says to us that the command is clear. There will be many detours and roadblocks in life. Some of you have had detours and roadblocks this past week. Satan would love nothing better than to distract you from your goal in life, from God's calling upon your life. But Joshua says to us, stay focused, stay on track, don't turn away. Don't turn to the right or turn to the left. Keep the word in your heart, meditate upon it. You heard those words earlier today. Follow God's given leadership, Joshua 1.17, from the, from the ones that God gives you in positions of leadership. Prepare yourselves, Joshua 1.11. Stay in God's word, Joshua 1.8. Hide the word of God in your heart. Commit the teachings to your life. Live it and obey it. Fourth, we understand that the consequences of failure to trust in God are certain. Verse 18. Joshua and the Israel, Israel, Israelites had already had a really good example of that because they saw Moses die for not listening to God's command. As great as he was, Moses was not immune from the judgment of God for rebelling against him. He was going to lead his people to the promised land. And because of his failure to follow God's command, he did not make it. You know, if we take a different path, it probably won't mean sudden death like Moses. But it can mean the death of a great opportunity, a wonderful life, a career, a calling, a family, friendships. And if that happens, the only thing we're left with is a hard, unfulfilled existence on an unforgiving rock. What kind of life is that? The fifth thing that Joshua tells us in this morning's reading is, most of all, be strong and be courageous. Repeatedly in the book of Joshua, this prophet tells us, be strong and be of good courage. Why do you think God says to us over and over and over again, be strong and of good courage? He wanted to remind us of this very simple fact that because God is with us, we can be strong and of good courage because no matter what the world throws at us, we have our God present in our lives. That's how we can be strong and courageous in the face of some horrible circumstances. From Joshua to Paul to everywhere in between, God continues to send us a message. It's about the choices that we make in our life. Our new life begins with the choice of whether or not we will accept Christ as our Savior. Most of you know these two verses by heart, John 3.16 and 3.17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. That is your first choice. And after that first choice, there are so many defining moments and choices which flow naturally from that. Choices. Choices. You may choose to stay where you are, comfortable where you are, doing what you're doing, being who you are right now. One of the things that my wife and I decided with our first kids, our first three kids, is that they needed, and this is hard, but they needed to get out of Sussex County for a period of time. They needed to leave this place that we loved so much. So all of them went away to school. All of them went away to school. They all came back, but at least they had the opportunity to see that there was something else out there. They got a chance to move because I, I, I believe that had they not left, they would have done something entirely different with their lives than what they're doing right now. We would have been very comfy just kind of sitting around doing what we're doing. I'm very comfy where I am. Maybe you choose to leave everything that's familiar to you to head out into that great, big, wide, wonderful, open world waiting to see what God has planned for you from here. Many of you that have moved here came here after spending years and years of coming down, coming down, coming down. You move from little campers to little trailers to bigger, and so you've come. But, you know, when you make that first step, it was a big step. I still want to know which one of the last one of you is going to turn out the lights in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania when you all have moved here from Pennsylvania. But it's a big change that we face. For many of us, myself mostly included, if we choose to stay where we are most comfortable, then those choices don't lead to a whole lot of change. If I'm perfectly content where I am in my box with all of my toys around me, I'm not going to change a whole lot. 
I can tell you that for me, my most significant change in life, the most significant growth I had was when I got out of my comfort zone. When I left behind the things that I knew and the things that I didn't know, even though I swore, swore there was nothing I didn't know at the time, I still left. I told Kyle at First Church I was going to tell everybody how old he is because he's two years older than I am, so you can figure this out. Forty-three years ago, a young kid from a small town in southern Delaware had less than a thousand people in the town when we left left behind the comforts of home and family and security and stability and headed off to a strange land that had 15,000 people in it. It was called the University of Delaware. From there, it was New Jersey and New York and Maryland and D.C. and all over the world. But it all started with my choice to leave behind that which I knew for that which I didn't. Robert Frost perhaps said it in a way that most of you are familiar. Joshua and Paul and others had written it, but Robert Frost said this. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both to be and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then the other, as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though as for that one passing, there had warned them about really the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves, no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first one for another day. Yet, knowing how way leads on way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I, took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Robert Frost, The Road Not Taken. Frost speaks to the choices that we make and the choices that we take. Two roads diverge in a wood. Which one will you take? My prayer for you is that you will take the one less traveled by. And that will make all the difference. The choices we make define us, regardless of our age and stage in life. May we pray to have the eyes to see and the ears to hear when the Master brings those defining moments in our lives. Let us pray. Lord, we come here this day to worship you. We come here perhaps believing it to be our own choice, our own idea, our own wisdom. But we are here nonetheless, Lord, coming today to worship you. We thank you for the blessing of worship, and we thank you for the blessings of blessing. Lord, we pray that the choices that we make, not only today but in days ahead, will be choices which will be fulfilling of the call you have laid upon our heart. Sometimes the choices we make are bad ones. Sometimes the things we do are regrettable and sinful. But seeking your forgiveness, repenting, and changing means that we can get back on the path and continue to make good choices to move forth in what you have called upon your brothers and sisters and the children of God to do. Father, we pray that you will use the words that were spoken, the songs that were sung, the fellowship that is received, and the worship that is given to point all of us in this right direction this day, Father. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. As we prepare to celebrate the sacraments of communion, I'd ask if you'd rise and say together that which makes us and tells the world who we are as set forth in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. Thank you, church. You may be seated. As we come together today and prepare to celebrate the sacrament of communion, I remind you that the sacrament, the Lord's table, is open to all who profess the faith. 
You don't need to be a Methodist. You don't need to be a Presbyterian. You don't need to be a nothing. You need to be a person who has faith in our God and our salvation through Christ. This table is open to all of that faith. If you wish to receive the gluten-free elements of communion, this morning I'll be on your left, my right. If you wish to receive those elements, please simply form up in that line. Also, if you would wish to come to receive a blessing through either Leslie or I, rather than, than celebrate with the elements, let us know as you come to the head of the line. We would gladly participate in a blessing for you and with you and through you, that we may all be blessed. So if you will now, join with me as we come together to celebrate the great Thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, the Creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets, who look for that day when justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. When nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. At his ascension, you exalted him to sit and reign with you at your right hand. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and grape. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, as Jesus has so invited us, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, the body of Christ, broken for you, take, eat. The blood of Christ poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of him. Family, the table is now open, prepared, and ready to receive you. Please follow the directions or the instructions of your ushers as you're sent forward, as you're called out to come and to celebrate with the Lord at the Lord's table. Come now and let us celebrate.
Church, let us pray. Father, for the blessings you have showered upon your people, most importantly this morning as we gather, the blessing to come to worship you, the freedom to come and worship you, the love to come and worship you, the choice to come and worship you, we give you thanks. We pray, Lord, that we will hear and listen and discern what Joshua and Moses have told us this day, what Paul and the disciples have shared with us from days gone, from days gone by, years and years past. The choices that we make today, may they be based upon your call upon our lives. May we always remember that you have called upon us to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with a world that does not yet know it, but a world that needs it so desperately. Bless us and strengthen us in our choices, O Lord, that we may know and be called children of God, brothers and sisters in Christ, on that most final day. We ask this in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen and amen. As if the last one wasn't enough to get you singing and out of breath, we're going to rise today and we're going to sing, Do Lord Remember Me, number 527. I'd ask you to rise in body or in spirit and sing together, Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do you remember me. Amen. I know, they, you know, I was kind of hoping that I got a home in glory land and come, and I was hoping that would get you moving, but uh, I've got a home in glory land, I've got to get to the grill, I've got a home in glory land, I've got to get to the grill, I've got a home in glory land, will you please shut up, Pastor, oh, do, Lord, oh, do, shut up. We who were once lone individuals are united in one body, in one family, with one God to share God's unifying love with a world that so desperately needs Him. Go now in peace and joy and love. Go in peace. Amen and amen. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Do Lord.